say in one hit. Yeah, regenerative. <laughs> regenerative. We are going to a talk about regenerative. <laughs> Why can't we say that? No, 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 no. We're dark from the country. Yeah, regenerative. Yeah. Regenerative. You said it then, me. Really. You like the video? Give it a like. Subscribe. And stay watching until the end. We'll show you all the cool machines. Visual film is stronger from the um, Yeah. Hit subscribe. <laughs> Life stuck up title uh, Nature Friendly Farming, Improving Your Farm's Bottom Line, Biodiversity and Carbon Footprint. We all run businesses, and that's the fundamental thing we need to remember. So, I'm a third generation farmer, uh, I say com com predominantly combinable crops. I used to call myself an arable farmer, I think I'm called a mixed farmer now. Uh, I'm concentrating on biodiversity, worms, and some livestock, as well as growing crops. But the, uh, post war, the drive was mechanical uh, mechanisation and remove hedgerows, remove environmental features, fill ditches in. Government policy and the system may encouraged us to do it. So in fact actively it paid us to do it. So in the past focus was all about food production. Biggest highest yield as possible. That's all we're told to do. Get on with it, produce more. But the more I understand now my soil, my landscape and its true productivity, I can produce more. So my focus now is to produce as much as possible for the best margin, not yield, margin, for all the goods and services the public are asking for. So it's food, biodiversity, carbon capture, water holding, public access, as long as the payments are right, I can help deliver some of it, and as long as it fits my business model. So it makes me more profitable, more balanced in my output, and more resilient to changes. I love using lots of data uh, and technology. So most of these are similar things that most people do. So we have all our fields scanned, we think it's one field and one soil, but how many different soil types are in, within the field? And each one of those need different inputs. We have traditionally went out and put the same amount of product across the whole field. The more we understand it, the more we don't need to do that. So we can vary our seed rates going, using that drill. We've got 70% germination, 80% germination. So I can tailor my inputs to where we've got good soil, reduce the seed rates. Where it's a bad soil, or we think we may have a slug problem, or a black grass problem, I can zone those and up the seed rates. So we can put the right seeds in the right place to get a more even and better establishment. Our P's and K's, we can zone those out. Why go out and do a whole field with a bag of fertiliser, when we only need to put it in one or two spots? Cuts our cost, yes I have to pay for the technology, but we're saving between eight and 10,000, well previously eight and 10,000 pounds a tonne, uh, uh, a year. Um, now we'll be, I don't know what we'll be saving. So these are the yield maps coming off combines. And I think they're the best knowledge tool you can get from any piece of investment you can do. Basically green is profit, red is loss. And if I can't make that red turn green, why am I farming it? So for me, if I can't improve the areas, take them out of production. I can put habitats in and get paid six, eight hundred pounds a hectare. We also use a lot of biomass and satellite imagery. So this is uh, this is a field of uh, winter wheat uh, last month. I still hasn't had any fertiliser, artificial fertiliser put on it. The stripes are flower strips I'm putting in the middle of the fields. I recognise the benefit of biodiversity, so that actually picks them out as well. So before, we used to just do buffer zones around water courses. We mustn't let any of our products enter a water course. Previously, we've got away with it. What's coming is the pollutant pays principle, and if you pollute a water course with your product or your soil, you're going to be paying to clear that up. So the more we can do to protect it, the better. And then what we've ended up doing in the last agreement was squaring off. Anywhere we have overlaps and orchid shaped pieces, you double the cultivation, you double the input, you overlap with the seed. So your costs are double in most of those areas, but your output's not. So if you take them out, your average yield goes up because you've taken your bits, your inputs have gone down. If I've got, this field is uh, six, seven, 17 hectares, but when we drill it, it's probably near 19 hectares because of all the awkward shapes. When I buy my seed, do I buy it for the field size or the drill size? When I buy my fertiliser, my, chem my chemical, do I buy it for the field size or the, what I know the application size is? If I buy it for the application size, I'm legally breaking, the, I'm, I'm actually breaking the law because I'm putting too much product on because we're buying more than what the field size is and so wants to check my records. So we've just straightened bits out. So those areas we take out of production, uh, we can work out which bird seed mixes in. So anyone's got an interest in wildlife shooting or sport, uh, you can put these in, get paid to do it. So we put herbal, these bird seed mixes in for different species, always put a flowering element in it, um, because in, uh, birds like an insect before they like a seed. So some of them are quite large areas. 
but also means our machinery still fits within them. If it goes small, you've got to fiddle around and faff about, and also half of it gets, the edges get eaten, and then you lose half because you don't look very good. I like to make it look good. And also I like to talk to the public about what we're doing, because they're funding this, and it's making my business better because we're doing it. Right through the farm, as we've got water courses, we've done, we've straightened them off, the water course is wobbled. We've just done some straight lines, delivering flower mixes as an interconnecting hoop right through the farm. So we make our wildlife move across the farm. I want a little bumblebee, so we're seeing more pollinators come on the farm. My pollinated crops yields going up, and I can map that on my combine. So it's like, there's a free benefit. They should give me free gifts. In this field here, we had winter beans nine years ago now. Um, come next month, we had, it was full of black bean aphids, getting absolutely hammered with black bean aphid. Gordon has said, better put an insecticide on, fine. Father says, yep, yep. So it got wet and windy for about 10 days, and I couldn't do it. Apart from, there was a couple of times I could have done, but I was out gallivanting about. But the, um, so father wasn't best pleased with me. Um, but actually, before I'd come to put the uh, insecticide in the tank, I went and looked at the beans, and actually what we found is all the aphids are almost gone, but it's full of ladybirds, hoverflies and stuff that come out of these margins and gone to eat the aphids. So I now, I haven't used insecticides across the farm for nine, will be nine years this spring or this summer. We don't need them. I can use these habitats to make my yield better. And what we're now doing is putting these habitats in the middle of the fields. I'm a 30 metre sprayer, so every 120 metres we're putting a six metre strips of flowers in across all my fields because I need to get these creepy crawlies and these bugs in the middle of my fields. If you've got a large arable field, the, the uh, aphid comes along, straight in the middle of the field, the beneficiaries that eat that will cut, takes that days to get to the middle of the field. So we're trying to put strips in the middle. And I get paid for doing this, and it's not my unproductive bits, it's protecting my watercourses. Many of our core, our business costs are maintaining the environment. So if you're a livestock farmer, you would probably call this a livestock fence. But if I talk to a policy maker and government, this is an environmental protection feature, and they'll pay me seven or eight pounds a metre to put a fence in. We change the language, public paid money, uh, to help d d deliver better. We've got more hedgerows, we rotationally mow them, uh, trim them, we always put a margin in. We do all our hedge cutting in January and February when we're quieter. We do the odd bit in the autumn, uh, where we need to, or it's a really wet field. All the water courses have buffers. Don't go and cut all your buffers all the time. Every time you get a mower out, that costs you money. So why do it all of it? And then all your beneficiaries will live in these unharvested bits, or unmowed bits, during the winter to come back out and help you feel. So this is how we used to cultivate our soil. Uh, like many, we used to burn years ago, and then we started ploughing, because we had to. And in the bottom of the furrow, because we're running in the furrow with the tractor, where we ploughed two seasons before was the tread print. So all of our weight of our tractor was squashed the soil in the bottom of our furrow. And that made me really sit up and think that we're putting all that compaction below the zone that we're cultivating. And then we're coming in with the subsoiler to go even deeper to lift more soil up. We were causing our own problems in soil compaction, soil health degradation. And all the worms, that, there's three sorts of worms that live in the top centimetres, the first lot, we buried and we lost them. The ones in the middle, down to about 30 centimetres, we tossed them about. And the really big, deep ones, the real big, fat, chunky ones, we chopped all their tunnels off. So we lost most of those. We still saw worms, we still saw seagulls. So these structures were suddenly lost and that structure of the soil was lost. So that really started to make me change what we did. We ended up getting rid of, well, we found an old DP2 plough, crawler plough and some nettles, uh, got that out, managed to rig it up so we ran on top of the soil so the compaction we put in the soil, we could turn over. So it reduced the depth of what we're compacting. So we looked at different machines. We ended up with a Coombe performer. Um, what I liked about this, uh, that this can work with the front discs within a, a couple of inches, a couple of five, two, th two to five centimetres, and I can just run the packer at the back, or I can stick the legs in, anything down to 30 centimetres. So what we started to do is zone the fields of what was the problem in that field. If it's compaction and it's at a depth, do I need a subsoiler to go and sort it out, or can I get this in to sort it out? If there's no compaction, <coughs> why am I moving soil? Why are we, you know, I see so many machines going up and down fields and every field they go in is at the same set, set depth. They just go filth. Why? Why do you want to go and move soil? It, it costs you money, it, it destroys the structure of the soil, burns more and more diesel. So actually, if we care for what we do, we can move less soil. And the first thing is how the heck is our crop going to come through that? But the slots it makes where it cuts through with the opening disc and planting disc it's like a knife going through the, cup, the, the cover 
and all your, your crop comes up through that and you've got all that material laying on the surface. And it's really, really helped our soil health. So you're going to hear a lot more about carbon, everyone's talking about carbon, and it's very much of a focus of what we can do. So I can capture carbon through my cover crops by building, growing organic material and putting them back in the soil. When we, we also bring in some uh, chicken manure, some horse manure, any other organic material I can get hold of. This last year has gone through the roof, so we have to be a bit more careful in what we do. Um, when we started, we just got a contractor in with a spreader, that's about 500 tonne heat, chuck it on the field. And what we suddenly re realised that actually we weren't knowing what we're doing or the nutrient value of what we do. So everything's tested now, all the manures, the compost come in, and these are now on vary rates as well. So I can put the right product in the right place without overdosing uh, and really balance out the output. Also trying to put where we can put trees in, but many places around our farm, there's not many spaces for trees. Put more hedgerows in, but there's a big focus around trees and it's got to be the right tree in the right place. So the first thing that should ever enter a field after a harvester is that thing. It's the only bit of metal that needs to go in the field most times. Go and dig a hole. Where have you got compaction? You've driven, if your operator or yourself's driven across a field and you've seen areas of the field of difference, go and put a spade in there. Understand the difference, what's going on. And so what we, you know, go and chuck the spade around where we were in the past cultivating. So what we ended up doing is identifying the fields we had the worst problems, typically headlands, and the operator that had the cultivator had have a map of where to do it at eight inches, where to do it at four inches. So we'd do different places. And what we did over the number of years is got ourselves out of the soil. We don't, we cause compaction, don't cause compaction, don't need to move the soil. So yeah, so now we aim to put cover crops in wherever possible. So soon after harvest, I'll work out how many weeks will it be until we're planting again. Will that be an autumn crop? Will it be a cereal? Will it be a oilseed grape? Will it be winter beans, a broadleaf? Uh, are we going into a spring crop? So I can tailor my cover crop mixes and the thinking of what we do with these to what we need to do. And we allow the, we put, often put legumes in, so we build fertility up. What I'm trying to do now, instead of running on bare soil, if you go out to a cultivated field, and walk on it, you make footprints. Don't walk on the grass, you might make a dent, but you don't make any footprints. Use the roots, we're currently now using the roots to hold our machines up, and the biomass. So this is, you know, this is some of the stuff we're tackling. And you can see how it's put a real thick mat over the ground. So moving over to cover crops, see, I've got to redo these costings because fuel cost, cost has gone through the roof. Um, so obviously that, there's a different thing. But when we were ploughing, we are spending 170 plus pounds a hectare, uh, then we moved down to zero tills, we're down 50, so we've slashed up our costs. We're also, they're not my sheep, I don't particularly like sheep because they either want to run away or die, but we're working with a local shepherd now and building, helping him build his shepherd flock up, or his sheep flock up, grazing our, our ground. And this is the best thing. Fertiliser's best out of the bum than out of the bag. It's got more biology or more goodness to it. Those sheep are adding 20 to 40 kilos a hectare to fertility into our soil. These legumes that are in here and this cover crops adding more layers of fertility into my soil. So I'm needing less and less nitrogen. Over half our wheat this year has had no nitrogen, artificial nitrogen on it at all. So I'm using biodiversity as a natural pest control. As I said earlier, using that natural element through the flowering and the habitat of the cover crops or the edges and are for me in the middle of the fields. So we have, last year we had PGRO do it on spring beans doing Brinkley beetle samples, testing for pests, and later in the seeds, it, within the seed. So we have three, only three farms, ours, a farm that does is leaf, so they do some environmental measures and, and meet their standards, still use some insecticides, and a conventional one that still uses lots of insecticides. Our damage was 6%. The other one was 23%. They spray regularly for, 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 for pests. We don't spray, I haven't needed to spray. Look at the difference in pest damage, 23%, 11%. And he's spending money trying to control pests. I'm not. So then when we come to the biodiversity, per, the blue is the pest numbers, and the orange is the beneficiaries that eat the pests. The difference. So I can use nature to give me free pest control. Okay. So these are some of the uh, tissue, uh, the, uh, that's tissue analysis of a crop we haven't had any uh, fertiliser on. It's actually just here at the moment now, um, with the one I had this morning. So we've got more than enough fertility in the soil. Why do I want to put artificial fertiliser on? Previously, we were told it needs 220, 240 kilos a hectare. Crack on, put it on. I'm now starting to use a lot of data to say, actually, why? Yes, I've got fields that we have put some on that are less. 
Uh, this is our, we do soil sampling in February. We had 240 kilos, I can't see on there, 240 kilos of nitrogen within my wheat crop and within my soil. It's a data saying I don't need to. We had some other crops that had uh, less build-up process and hadn't had any organic material or manure placed in the last four or five years. It only got 80 kilos of nitrogen. That's 80 kilos of nitrogen I haven't bought this year. Um, this year's, you know, I've got more, my fertiliser tanks on the liquid fertiliser are full up and we're finished flying because uh, we haven't needed to use it. Um, fortunately, we've managed to buy it early and we're going to roll into the next season. The more we can use data to understand the need what we need to do, the more we fit it into building soil health up and through regenerative systems, the better. Um, so what does the future hold for farmers? We know public support for public money. Uh, the current system we're in is an area-based BPS. It's going. You've got six more years left and it'll be gone at one change. Uh, even if whoever organisation wants to fight to keep it, it won't stay there. Uh, we're going to move to a public money for public goods model where we're rewarded for doing delivery of stuff society wants. The biggest challenge we're going to have is climate change, wildlife, extinction and pollution. They are going to be society's issues and focus in the future. How can we tackle climate change, reverse wildlife extinction and tackle our pollution issues? As farmers, we have to take responsibility for the issues we're causing to air quality, to water quality and, and other products, even food quality in many instances, the products we end up with in our food. Within England, we're going to come on to ELMS, Environmental Land Management Scheme. Uh, and that'll be in three different tiers. You're going to have the SFI, uh, Local Nature Recovery and Landscape Recovery. All available for BPS recipients until 2024, and then anyone who manages the landscape can get access to this funding. Biodiversity offsetting and carbon markets. I think this is the most exciting thing we need to get our heads around. Can you do a baseline? What's in your soil of carbon now in the next year or two? Because you're going to need to know. You can earn money out of this in a few years' time. So as farmers, most people use social media. Uh, it's a great tool. Communicate to the public what you're doing and why, but don't get in arguments about it. They will suck you into little rabbit holes and piling on you. Getting all like, certain, certain campaigners will put up a post to get all the farmers angry, so they'll all pile in, and then all their mates pile in and make us look like idiots. Because whatever we say doesn't work. Be careful, demonstrate to the public what you're doing. We put flower enlargements along the byway, so the public, the are the public in my field, but like they can see it. And we also use supplementary feeding in the winter to feed along there, so the public see the birds in the winter. And we had problems with a lot of dog walkers causing me problems, dogs everywhere, uh, off leads, and horse riders. I used to go and be that grumpy farmer and go and tell them off, I don't bother anymore. Just do a video and talk through the video, seeing all the wildlife fly off the other end. This dog's running around at a nesting period. Really disappointing. Doing all this good stuff, producing the, you know, making some food, seeing this dog destroy the wildlife. Put up on our farm Facebook page. I haven't been grumpy. The people in the village know who that dog is. Well, they ain't got here, when they went down the pub that night. We just change the way we do it. Don't be a grumpy person. But we do have problems, and we've got to explain to public their responsibility. If you haven't already, definitely calling out for farmers to get involved in their future schemes. It's huge opportunities to feed in. Uh, and they're always asking for people to feed in. Do keep an eye on the DEFRA website, because there's a lot of good information. Engage positively with your MPs. Uh, MPs need to hear, hear, hear the problems. Don't be moaning. Don't go and say you want more funding because your fertiliser bill's gone up. So is the local household electricity bill and their gas bill. We've just got to think about how we want a system and a trade system work in the future. Collect data. Collect data. Collect data. Uh, I'm talking to the John Deere people earlier about their machines collecting fuel data and everything else. The more you can have, the more you can understand, the better you are. You're going to need yield monitoring, carbon monitoring. But if you've got some volunteers who want to come and count some wildlife on your farm, some flowers, some birds, let them come. If you get a survey, because they've got development or road coming through, and they're going to do an environmental survey on your farm, collect the data. You're going to need that, because you're going to need to see improve, be able to improve improvements. And it all helps building a farming system that works for the future as your natural capital. The natural capital is your bank balance. The, I see nature and our biodiversity as a shareholder in my business. If I take away from it all the time, his dividend's getting less. That's my soil health. It's degrading. We need to feed it back in. And it can produce. some years we might rob it a little bit. Other years we put it back in. But it's a balance sheet. It sits on the balance sheet and will earn me money through hedgerows, through carbon payments. But also when I come to, if I ever wanted to market the farm, it sits on the balance sheet as a better asset. 
just touch on my nature friendly farming network. Uh, independent research showed that there was a need for farmers, or farmers wanted to have a voice across the UK, who were demonstrating good environmental management and biodiversity and positive farming outputs. Their voice wasn't being heard. If we didn't do anything, we're going to have the same old problems and disappear uh, and have the same old challenges. And together we can achieve more. But we've got to demonstrate what we can do as farmers, not just in food production, but in balancing the landscape use. This seems to be the way forward then, folks. Mm. Direct drill. No, no more tillage. So you're going away from this sort of thing. And then more towards this sort of thing. Which you have to turn around and have a look at. I mean, it, it's dead simple, but really complicated. Um, but it kind of can do everything, I think. I don't know what it would work like on our black Fenland soil where everything bulldozes up because it's so fluffy. Oh, hi, hello, I'm Rupert Grease, uh, non-inversion um, mm -hmm. sales specialist for Central England for Coon Farm Machinery. Mm -hmm. um, we're here today at Ben Burgess Coates. We've had a regenerative morning, which has been quite successful. Interesting. Um, we've yep. got quite a few bits and pieces of kit out and about on, on, the, on the grass here. So we'll talk through some of them um, with you now. So to start off with, we've got the Coon Performer 4000, four meter all in one cultivator really with discs, obviously as you can see in the front here hydraulically adjustable um, we've got uh, hydraulic reset uh, legs um, on this particular model we've got the 50 up to 80 mil point with the um, carbide shares as well you can obviously have a different option of, uh, of narrower wings narrow, no wings at all and a 50 millimeter point right just okay. for a bit more deeper work obviously yeah. uh, this is a bit more shallow yeah um, uh, kind of like configuration a, here really you see for like lifting underneath your yeah. harvest traffic and what have you on yeah. this double much the same as like a terra disc type leg on it yeah it is very similar yeah. yeah 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 so we obviously got mixing chins as well so we get that good boil um uh, through 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 the stubble to clean out finishing uh, towards the back then obviously we've got hydraulically adjustable um leveling discs yeah they're not really cultivation discs they're just for like leveling off um, in front of the packer so it's like hills to holes so it doesn't have too much for the packer to do yeah um, we do have options of packers we can see a different packer on another machine when we get there this is the HD liner um, quite a nice heavy press down um, option I would say the majority of the machines that we supply are out, are out on this on this yeah. packer would, would that would that cut in there help them to turn more in yeah. lighter soils real yeah. light soils just get that grip just yeah, to get just that traction biting, yeah Good idea. Um, and then obviously you can put in a shouldered ridge so this will penetrate uh, into the soil and then you'll put a ridge in so it's a bit more it'll dry quicker or it will obviously yeah. be a bit more we weather weatherable is really yeah, the yeah. word I'd say so uh, that's the more the option I mean you can add on cedars onto this machine if you want to um, we start at three meter and we go right through to seven. So, how, how much horsepower would you need on a four meter like this? Well, it's like anything. Yeah, so you can so put lots. Of, you, can, you can use a lot of horsepower if you want to. But um, I was with one of these last Friday, and they were running with about 240 horsepower because they're running about four to six inches. So, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, weren't too worried about forward speed, but they're still getting 10, 12 kilometers an hour. So. Right, okay, that's not bad going. So it's it? not bad going. Let's take a walk across to um, the next machine. So we've got the Kuhn Optimer 9000L. Uh, it's a nine meter machine. So the L is referring to actually the size of the discs. We have a two different size discs. So we have an XL, yeah. which is a bigger disc. Yeah. The 620 millimeter, this one is in a 520. So won't cut quite so deep. I mean, you can go probably up to six inches of depth with this if needs be. Yeah. Um, not a huge amount of horsepower requirement. Obviously a little bit of a heavy kit. You just need some, uh, the yeah. right size the tractor. More, the more angle you've got on these and the deeper you want to go, the more horsepower you're going to need. Like. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. But um, discs have become more and more popular as we seem to be chopping more straw, certainly in this east of the country. Discs is always some, a nice option to go and tackle any trash and um, behind the combine. Yeah. So it, we, it, I mean, for me, like it's becoming more apparent, like we were having a talk inside that just an inch or two inches in the ground. Yeah. Go like mad, get everything to chip. Yes. And um, and then, then another kill or another pass with this to kill everything off. Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Yeah. That is pretty much the case. Or obviously what we're finding a lot of people using the, the Optimer discs for is again, is cover crop establishment you can if you get a cedar on you can cedar blow on. out you can go to 
uh, distribution heads to get the width yeah. and get the accuracy. That's no problem at all. Uh, with yeah, with cover crop destroying coming on much more popular, yeah. you're going to need to have discs to tackle it. So yes. uh, towards the back, obviously, the, this is the W roller, slightly different from what we were looking at on the performer earlier. This is an option on the performer. So what you get here is you obviously can get soil and soil contact. So this will fill up with soil and you can then just, uh, you've got a nice clearance in here and you've got the ability to be able to actually have soil on soil rather than that up smearing and, uh, okay. you know, sealing um, soil I off. I, I never really thought of that. Yeah, no, oh, that's okay, exactly yeah. what you get. They, they, you know, they're quite nice if these do fill up yeah. a little bit of soil. That's exactly what you want then. Yeah. Yep. And then you just get that tamping down and just that leveling off behind and obviously with the staggered configuration yeah you've got a nice flow always yeah. got flow of soil yeah, going yeah, yeah. through so not many options on it really the, the wheels are what they are for transport there's a central grease point you can see the grease banks on there so you can uh, do, do multiple outlets off one point so that yeah. makes quite a big difference I think quite a lot of operators <laughs> like that and it allows you to make sure you get grease into the places where you need to so uh, we do do a 12 meter version as well uh, and then backing off from that, we do a seven and a half, six, five, four, and a mounted three. So we'll take a look at the next piece of machinery we've got here today. At Coates is the Prolander 6000, so six meter machine. As you can see, we've got the option of the leveling board in the front with um, obviously your staggered rows of tines. So there's a lot of free flow here. This is a secondary cultivator. However, uh, with the change of points, we could put a big goose foot on, we can go for a primary, straight into stubble. Yeah. Just going back to that chit you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. We've got nice clearance underneath the machine, long enough legs, we've got the ability to allow trash to flow yeah. through. Back on again with a W roller as well. There is another option of a double cage roller. That's more in conjunction with secondary cultivation. So yeah. if you were getting land ready for sugar beet or small seeds in the spring behind plowed, yeah. and then obviously you're tampering and consolidating as before on the back. Yeah. yeah. Now, as I say, it's option on the front. So we do up to seven and a half meter on this, or option for the um, paddles on the front, sorry. So just do that leveling off and, and dragging if needed. Yeah, Prolander is, you know, quite, quite popular. I mean, it follows the plow primarily but we're now finding it again a bit more popularity this this black grass situation in arable areas people are wanting to just tickle the top around and correct we'll walk across now and we'll have a look at another machine that we've got so what we've got here is the prune striger 300 so it's a three meter fixed frame okay so this is a strip till cultivator yeah um so we were talking about it earlier this morning this fits in very well with uh, regenerative um, farming so what we've got here is, as you can see, is a, is a single um, row cultivator in different rows. Uh, this is a 50 centimeter um, spacing, and uh, we can obviously um, have the machine at uh, 75, 80. Uh, all different machines come with different widths. Yeah. And quite simply, we've got uh, transport wheels, an opening disc, and we've got trash clearers that are fully adjustable if required. Right. Uh, we've got a leg obviously that can be adjusted um, on these teeth here for the depth and then we've got discs either side and then we've got a finishing cage roller at the back so it's like a it's like a one row cultivator yeah because there's a single strip here that you will till and then the intermediate area is obviously left for either for like yeah. uh, cover then, crop or environmental scheme if you if you're then if you're whatever. then going to drill sugar beet in the in the springtime you can go in with this and open the soil up yep. let the air in and let the, yep. let the moisture in and you can go the in the autumn with it and then at one depth and then you could go again in the spring with yeah. a different depth so that's a bit like simulating plowing in the autumn or late winter plowing and then going again with a spring cultivator that's yeah. exactly what this machine can do it can do a bit of both really so available in six rows as you see it here we can go four rows at 75 centimeters that's very popular for maize yeah um, we can go right up to 12 rows on a six meter frame uh, we can do eight rows 75 centimeters yeah it's this has really taken off a lot of people are looking at it there's an interest in it for um, not releasing so much carbon so you only till the strip yeah and then you're obviously leaving that area in between yeah uh, that's become very popular it looks yep. uh, pretty scary well it is a bit scary yeah it's nothing to be scared of <laughs> okay but, uh, so it's the Kuhn Auroc uh, direct drill um, what we have here is uh, if we break this down into simple modules is probably four different elements to the machine which is a crimpler your double disc openers 
you've got your wheels here your press wheels and your tamping wheels and then you've obviously got your drilling seed bar on the back here actually the final fifth phase really is just the following harrow so we have the ability because it's twin tank we have the ability to be able to twin crop um, to, with this machine which allows us for example I, I've been out on a demonstration where we've been drilling spring beans on this front row and on the second row with a different rate and a different depth we've been drill, drilling um, spring oats so it's a company crop that we've been able to do yep. and uh, it's something that we've been trying to keep two crops away from each other for years yeah, and no, going back to our discussions of fashion and change yeah. that's exactly what's now coming into play here yeah. two tanks here on the main tank is split clean in half yeah three and a half thousand litre tank equally shared out but on the front as you can see the sh 1120 that's for small seeds okay that will blow and go straight into the venturi of the front tank and then you can obviously put two crops down to down one place at the same time yeah or you can just run your cover crops through the front hopper if you so wish okay you can do fertilizer through one of those tanks there's yeah. a lot of options and yeah. obviously we've got twin Outlet. Twin twin outlets, twin mushroom um, heads on there. The Vista Flow from Coon allows us to have uh, seed monitoring. It allows us to do customised tram lining as well. All blockage monitoring. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got articulation within the machine as well. It's quite an important feature of it. Uh, these two rams here, either side, will allow articulation. So we're always following with these discs. We're always following our opening discs. Yeah. So it's quite a nice feature, and it does look after itself pretty much. So. I mean, it, it looks a mega bit of kit, and it looks fairly simple compared. Uh, I'd say it looks simple. I mean. It is. It is. It, it, it looks more. Um, mind-boggling when it's folded up and it turns up on the lorry and everyone's like oh my gosh whatever have you bought out but you get it unfolded and you start breaking it out and actually yeah. it's a uh, it's quite a straightforward piece of kit really yeah. Um, yeah. i like the idea that it's got the, the slicer on the front for the, the yeah yeah the crimpler i mean you know that's uh you can get uh, seven crimples every meter right so the idea of crimping a, a cover crop is not to go right through it but just to obviously just give it that slow breakdown so yeah. it doesn't just die immediately yeah. it's a slow breakdown it keeps a bit of moisture in the soil um, gives you a bit of cover still while the crop is establishing and then it comes through so. all the ideas that you've thrown out there today with all the machinery and the, and the ideas in the in the presentation yep I like the idea of I like the idea that stubble on the top or the or the cover crop on top is is saving my soil yeah it's basically stopping it blowing away put you on the spot a little bit Rupert what are the discs like when it's wet? Because some of, on the video in there, he doesn't look like he would pull anything. No, he's got some of uh, four hundred some heavy out. land, isn't he? I yeah. mean, everything has its limitations. Yeah. If I said it floated on water, we, we yeah, all, yeah, everyone yeah. would know I was yeah. lying. The world's greatest uh, salesman. Correct. H however, I, obviously, what I would say about from a point of view of pulling the machine, you got to think everything that engages with the ground turns yeah so that's the big difference between a disc and a tine straight away yeah, yeah, is the yeah. amount of inertia created these are turning so every time as soon as you start moving there's no resistance I totally get the concept of trying to leave my soil and leave the worms and the cover crops we're already growing anyway so we're already halfway there just need to get that final yeah that final step cool yeah. thank you very much Rupert. thank you okay, really really guys. appreciate it thanks thanks for thank you time. thank you yeah. now on our way back from ben Burgess, uh coach brian so we've had our little um, day out interesting isn't it yeah i mean get farming in different ways generally the gist of it was that soon a lot of the techniques that farmers use won't be able to be used for that long because of like the fossil fuel issues and the way that the planet is going that basically is is what i got from today yeah 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 i mean we can't keep burning fossil fuel but um they're going to run out one day so man-made fertilizers is obviously really bad for the environment but the farming is a cycle of life i'm not entirely sure i i get my head around it yet i really don't um i can't work out what the end result is going to be um because farming's not a, a net zero carbon zero um industry anyway it's a, it's a constant cycle of uh, carbon capture carbon release and carbon capture and carbon release so i don't understand how we can um, offset other people's carbon by not being carbon neutral ourselves so i don't know uh, interesting talk great great different points of view and um martin lines is definitely um 
definitely got some good techniques and uh, he's happy to share his advice. By the sounds of it, the way that he was talking, it's like farming has got to change, but it will just, you know, if you can just do it bit, a bit by bit, yeah. then that would help, you know, you so it's not so scary. Yeah. But I said to him, like, if, if, like, for you guys, where would you even start? And he said, just do like a strip and then just see what happens. And then, you know, if it works well, try it again next year. Yeah. And then, if again, if it works well, keep 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 experimenting with it. So, yeah. thank you for watching, guys. What we got to do if we like the video? Subscribe. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Keep conversation going. If you try direct drilling, yeah. let us know. Bye. Bye, 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 bye.